Hi, we're Gary and Linda from Blazing New Trails. We're happy to have you with us today. And Linda, there's a lot when you're in RVing that you don't know until you know. Until you know. <laughs> and so we're excited to share some of those things with you today, but we're going to talk about and focus on travel days. Travel days. But first, we do have a bit of sad news that we that we need to share. Yeah. And on this last trip, we took what I like to call our six and six trip. So six weeks, 6,000 miles. And we went out west to Yellowstone, to the Grand Tetons, Glacier, and we went north to Banff. Yep. But on that trip, on the, actually the very, the very beginning. first few days, our little Rosie wasn't doing well. Uh, we'd had her 10 years, she was 15 years old, she wasn't eating, not doing well at all. And we're going to talk about the stress of travel days. And this, unlike any other travel day, uh, travel period, was a terrible stress because we had to put Rosie down. And it was one of the toughest things that we've had to do. Uh, she was our travel companion. Uh, she loved going on hikes with us. She was just a, an amazing little companion. And it was so hard to do, especially on the road. And it's just, it's really tough not seeing her in her normal places. So anyway, um, a lot of you have seen her in our videos and our pictures. And so we just felt it was important to bring you up to date with that tragic event that we had to endure. Yeah. So anyway, let's move on. Yes. And let's let's talk about travel days and what we're hoping to share with you is maybe some ways that you might be able to help reduce stress, time, and even maybe save some money. Yeah. Kaching. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's so many things that are out of your control when uh, you're traveling. So if you can you know, pre-plan and hopefully ease some of that for when those things do happen and be prepared, um, it'll make it a little easier on you. Yeah, and some of these things may be obvious, especially to the, those of you who have been traveling for a while, but, you know, we feel that we've learned maybe a few things and uh, maybe there's some nuggets that we might be able to impart on you. So we've got 10 traveling tips, what we're calling stressors, stressors. <laughs> and then there'll be a bonus stressor, so stick around for that. Okay, stressor number one. Let's talk about planning your trip. One of the most important things, and this is something you will hear all over, is the 333 rule. So that means driving no more than 300 miles, or right around there. Um, arriving at your destination by 3 p.m. so that you have plenty of time to get set up and have dinner, <laughs> um, relax. And then number three is to... Um, oh. Stay at your site at least three days. That's it. Which <laughs> we really don't follow. We, <laughs> we follow pretty much the 300 miles. But we are the type that like to get up later Gary likes to, you know, it takes him a while to get up. Me, I am up and I'm ready to go. Well, but the other thing too is when I'm running. That's true. I, I like to get in a workout mm -hmm. and, and I will get up early to do that. Because what I find is not only getting my workout in keeps me on my workout schedule, but it gives me the, a little bit more energy mm -hmm. to to really to drive all help, day. Help, help with the trip. So... <laughs> I mean that's that's something that you might think about too is do your do your workout if, if you do work out do that before you leave. Yeah, that's Kobe. He is our grand dog, and mom and and the girls are on vacation, so <laughs> we're dog sitting. <laughs> so yeah, so we tend to not leave until between ten and eleven most days, which means we're going to drive longer throughout the day. Um, but I do make a point, like when we were in Wyoming and we were going into Denver, I was adamant about leaving early that day because I knew we were going to have to deal with Denver traffic later in the afternoon. Not even later, actually. Denver has traffic all day well, on we, every highway. We got there at 
two o'clock. And oh my gosh, it was already it was crazy. Of course, it didn't help that there was an accident, but yeah, anyway. but all the highways. <laughs> um, as far as staying three days, I mean, of course, that's going to be hard if you are traveling to a destination where you're going to stay for several days. So um, breaking up the trip, even for one day, if you're traveling like six days to get yeah. somewhere, that helps. Well, and it does. And this kind of gets into another segue. If you have one driver, yes, that, that stress really builds all that much more. So, however, if you have two drivers, obviously you're able to drive much further. Yes. Now, so, and some people are okay with that. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Kobe. Kobe. Okay. All right. Okay. Here's our buddy. <laughs> and then some people are okay with driving at night. We're, we're really not. Now we've been forced into it a few times. Yeah. But it's really, for us, we really don't care for it because bad things can happen when it's dark. Yeah. Now, it's harder the, to see the, the road, too. It times. is. Now, now the, I think the other side of that, too, is maybe there's less traffic. So, I mean, that that's a little bit of a benefit. But for us, I think the disadvantages really outweigh the advantages. Yes. So we just prefer not to. Right. And, you know, as far as limiting your time in your drive time, that is, some people prefer to step on the gas pedal a little bit more. But... Uh, we've got a later segment that we'll talk a little bit about that, and we really prefer not to speed. Right. Okay, stressor number two is having one campground to stay in versus multiple campgrounds when you're in a certain area. For example, we are going to be traveling to Oregon next year, and we're going to do the coast. And there's several different small towns along the coast that we would like to see. So we're going to start at the bottom because we're going to go to Redwood National Park first. Um, then we're going to go to Florence and then Newport and then Cannon Beach. So come to find out, I, I was planning that you have a drive day, two full days to see a place, explore, then another drive day to travel or to explore days, etc. So I thought, well, you know what? Florence and Newport are pretty close together. They're about 90 miles apart, I think. And I thought, well, why wouldn't we stay in the middle of those two towns, somewhere in between, and then just, you know, just leave the camper there. That way you're also not putting more miles on your camper and trying to get in and out of little towns and whatnot. So just park your camper in one place and then go north and visit for a day, go south for a couple of days, you know, back and forth, and just put the miles on your truck and not on your camper too and having to hitch and unhitch. And, and save a little bit of in gas. A little bit because, of gas because too. You're not, because you're not pulling your camper. Right. And the wear and tear obviously on the camper. And then just the stress of hooking up and, you know, just kind of deal, dealing with that. <laughs> It's, it's a lot easier to get around some of these small towns in the truck versus the truck yeah. and the camper. Right. Okay, stressor number three. Know the weather forecast for your trip. Unfortunately, weather is something we can't control. <laughs> but I think you can maybe control it a little bit if you maybe know what to expect. Yep. Weather.com is your friend. Or exactly. at your weather, whatever you like. <laughs> exactly. Because you don't want to be driving in a rainstorm, dealing with sleet, hail, or even snow oh. for that matter. Or wind. Even windy days. And you can tell that on weather.com yeah. too. They'll let you know. Especially those tornadic conditions. Yeah. So just to kind of give you guys an idea, um, this goes back to our very first RV trip back in 2020. And we were visiting our kids in Denver. And this was a borrowed camper off of RV Share. Mm -hmm. and so, our very first trip with an RV. Yeah. We had no idea what to do about anything. And it was a tail end of our trip. Yep. Labor Day weekend. And it had been in the mid-90s. Oh, it was hot. It was, it was <laughs> brutally terrible. But there was a snowstorm moving in. Of all, of all things, over Labor Day Labor weekend. Day. 
So it was supposed to hit on Labor Day. And uh, because of that, we decided to cut our visit a day short. <laughs> so we felt better just leaving a day early so that we would stay ahead of the storm. And we did, but the thing is, it caught up to us. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and another major point about this segment is wind. And that wind caught up to us, and this was my first experience driving in a terrible set of conditions with the wind. And it was blowing us sideways, semis were passing us, and so you talk about being white knuckled. Another way to get ahead of the wind, leave early. As you know, the wind picks up throughout the day. So if you can leave an hour or two early and get on the road, you can kind of get ahead of some of that wind, at least have a few hours to drive where you don't have the heavy wind. Yeah, and I would say, just to wrap this whole segment up, just know what kind of conditions you're comfortable driving in and just I always prepare for the worst and maybe you'll be surprised and it won't be quite as bad. Okay, stressor number four, hunger. <laughs> so you want to make sure that first of all, you have a good breakfast in the morning, something that's going to sustain you for a good part of the day. Um, then, of course, you might need snacks. Got anything good to eat, Jason? Oh, I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> Let's see. We got chips, popcorn, cookies, fruit snacks. Awesome. Uh, depending on how many people, it's just Gary and I. So he likes his Cliff Bars. He'll bring a couple of those. I usually bring something like a Luna Bar. Uh, you know, we get our protein from that. Um, I always, I have to have something to nosh on. I like to have some some pretzels or uh, Cheez-Its or another one that's my favorites. Uh, Gary likes these little cheese and crackers. Also, don't forget some fresh fruit. And if you don't have fresh fruit, how about some applesauce? I usually make sure that we have some plastic utensils for whatever we might have. So just some things, we always put them in a little bag and put a, um, a cool, cool pack, cool pack in the bottom so that we have snacks in the car. We don't have to keep stopping and spending a ton of money at truck stops. They are so expensive. So then we also try to bring our own lunch some days, not always. Um, Gary's favorite is peanut butter and jelly. So we'll make that. Just put things in Tupperware. You know, if you're gonna have a little salad, Put your dressing in a little container like this. So I think it's also important to stop for lunch. Stop somewhere, whether it's a rest area, a little park, a truck stop, and eat there. Don't eat while you're going down the roads, because sure enough, you're gonna have something drop on your lap or something, and now you're gonna go into another lane. So it's, it's better to get out of the truck, stretch your legs, stretch your body, have something to eat, use the restroom, walk the dog, and then get back on the road. Now, one of our favorite places to stop, and probably yours too, is Bucky's. <laughs> we don't usually shop much in there, but we love their barbecue sandwiches. So, and Gary gets a nice big drink. Iced tea. Iced tea for Gary. <laughs> Okay, Gary, stressor number five, consolidating pit stops. <laughs> you know, we want to make the best of our time when possible, maybe consolidating your potty stops, gas stops. Dog walking. Maybe you got to walk the dog. <laughs> because who to, with your dog, we never know sometimes what schedule they're on. Right. Funny thing with Rosie, we would always know with her. She'd, she'd, be, she'd be pacing in the back <laughs> seat. <laughs> and then food. Got to have something to eat, too. Yeah. So if you can consolidate as many of those as possible, that'll help with your stress of, oh my gosh, I have to stop again. You know, I wish we could all be on the same time schedule, right? <laughs> For our potty stops. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes nature doesn't allow that. Right, but, right. Uh, every now and then there's times when you can, we can take advantage of that and use it to our advantage. Right. 
stressor number six. And what, while we're talking about consolidating stops, let's talk about making efficient stops for gas. Yeah. Now we, we, we made this one kind of on its own because we feel it's really important and, and that's really a, a good opportunity to maybe save some money. You know, I'm the one that's the driver in the family, but Linda plays an, a crucial role. Yes. Because she's my co-pilot. She tells me where to go when I'm driving <laughs> and not. <laughs> but I like to use the, our, our Ford F-250 has a, a gauge where it tells me how many miles of gas that I have. Now, sometimes it's not always accurate, but usually at about 100 to 125 miles, I'm telling Linda that it's time to start looking. And that way she can get on Gas Buddy, she can get on iExit, uh, mud, flap. mud Flap, and start looking for that inexpensively priced gas. You and, know, <laughs> now, inexpensive. <laughs> what it is. When it's possible. <laughs> but the other thing too is, we don't always stop at a truck stop like a Pilot or any of those other guys because they charge an outrageous amount so there's times when Linda might find a great price but she's also using her Google Maps to go to the Street, View. Street View and and seeing if it's something that that we can fit into yes because we have had an instance only happened once because we learned our lesson the first time of going somewhere it was off the road a mile or so down the road and it was a little mom-and-pop place and their awning was really low not much space to get around the um, the gas pumps so you know it took us a 10-point turn to get out I think we almost didn't get out so I exit is good for food stops and for gas um, if you've never used it you should give it a try it's free mm -hmm. and you can see what's coming up he'll tell me I, I have a hundred miles left so I, I'll tell him okay in 45 miles in 70 miles there's a gas station with a lower price gas um, if it's a windy day yeah that's one caveat yes then you really have to be careful because your gas goes the monitor or whatever goes down so fast with the wind make sure you allow yourself a buffer yes. because sometimes it can really play havoc and what you think you've got as a reserve isn't going to be there so have several options laid out oh stressor number seven and, and this oh oh no <laughs> that this really can be a huge stressor because yes. we're going to talk about terrible roads yeah. and we know how terrible roads we hear about RVs being an earthquake on wheels and that's true without the terrible roads yeah but when you've got the roads that are in deplorable condition it just really adds to the havoc that you can place on your RV on the inside too because by the time you park somewhere and you go inside and you see the drawers open <laughs> and things that have flown across the room and yeah that it's not good for your RV but I mean we really don't have a lot of control over it except for trying to move out of the way as much as you can so you know some of these roads and we've gotten familiar with some of them I, we the have top, our favorites yeah at the top of the list because we've been out to Denver several times because that's where our daughters live the and eastern Albuquerque. side of I-70 is just, there's there's probably about 15 or so miles. It's just absolutely terrible. Yes. Then you've got the eastern side of Albuquerque on 40. 40. And then we just learned about a new section because we were <laughs> in Quartzsite this past winter. Quartzsite, Arizona, which is Arizona. on the, the far western side yeah. of Arizona. And that's, that's I-10. And, I mean, I-10 was so bad, everybody... At, at the, the, rally. Uh, the rally was talking about it. <laughs> so how can you compensate? Well, one is obviously to slow down a little bit because the slower you're going, the less impact your truck or your vehicle and your camper are going to take. The other thing I'd like to do too is I like to watch the vehicles in front of me just to see what they're experiencing because I'm always looking for a line on the road, not, not a 
real line, but just a, a line to drive on that, that's going to give us maybe more of a clear path mm -hmm. to, to get past those potholes, the patch jobs that are sometimes so terrible. Yeah. Or I'll move into the other lane if I can. Because yeah. sometimes that might be in better condition. It always seems like the right-hand lane is just in the worst condition. Yeah, because it, well, it gets the most traffic. Yeah, and it gets the most um, yeah. semis on it, too. Yeah. The yeah. other thing is when you're coming up to what's an overpass over a road that's below you, I'll tell you what, it's never flat. Yeah. <laughs> you always know that because you go up and then you go down every single time. Yeah. The, the seam between the road and the bridge just never seems to be level. And sometimes they're the worst. Yeah. So, so make sure you're on the lookout for that because yeah. those can really be a, a huge surprise. Yeah. Great roads in our country. <laughs> Thank goodness for the infrastructure bill. <laughs> this next one, stressor number eight, is Linda's favorite. Silence in the cab. Yeah. I can't be quiet. I can't be quiet. <laughs> Poor Gary, but I keep him awake, right? <laughs> so, Gary, you know, when you're driving, you're concentrating on the road. You're trying to keep track of everything. You don't want to listen to somebody yapping. So, I have tried to learn how to keep myself busy. So, here, I don't know if you can see, but I have um, a folder here on my phone that is audiobooks and podcasts, music, and then I always carry my earbuds and it helps me to really pass the time by listening to a book or a good podcast for sure. Yeah, I mean, Linda talked about a little bit earlier with me, my concentration is on the road. It's the gauges, the tire monitor, the, or the rear camera, the rear view mirrors, just, and, and it could also be the weather too. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what are we dealing with weather-wise? So. I'm trying to get us there, obviously, safe and sound, and sometimes, I'm sorry, those things are distracting, Yeah. and I've got to have my focus on the road. So That's right. The very first trip, and we were talking about that storm earlier mm -hmm. when we were returning from Denver, it was a white knuckle drive because the wind had caught up with us, and there was silence for probably two hours. Oh yeah, but you know, I was on my phone, I was trying to watch the weather and the roads to make sure that in fact, even we've had another trip when we were leaving Albuquerque. We left Albuquerque early on Thanksgiving to stay ahead of a storm. And I had both of our phones open. His, I think, was on the weather and radar, and mine was on the road conditions and to see if there were any accidents or slowdowns in front of us. And Waze is a great app for that. Um, so, you know, we were both being quiet because I was trying to concentrate for him too. So, another way to keep busy um, while you're driving down the road for the passenger is if you're working or something that you can work on and you have your laptop or an iPad and you can keep busy. Sometimes silence has to be golden. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, stressor number nine is about cruise control and knowing how fast you're going to drive. Now, funny thing, I didn't pick this shirt because of this particular topic. It's the Grand Prix 5K race in St. Pete. <laughs> but with cruise control, um, with me, I don't like it when I'm pulling a camper because I like to be in control. And what that means to me is, especially if it's a kind of a hilly road, I like to be able to drive a little bit faster down the hill and then with the oncoming hill, use that momentum, take my foot off the gas a little bit and use that momentum to get up that hill. So I guess it's in a way, it's my way of saving gas, getting better gas mileage. And I just don't like having a cruise control do that for me. So when it comes to driving fast, you know, all of us have been on the highway and I like to keep it around 65 to 70, unless I'm going downhill, it'll obviously be a little bit faster. But it just, it cracks me up. Every time I see somebody driving by in the passing lane, 
and they're pulling a camper and they're just absolutely flying. They might be doing 80, 85, 90 miles an hour. And, you know, that just, I think, sets us up for potential, not only problems, maybe with the police, but it's dangerous because you never know when you're going to have a blowout. So you can't stop fast if somebody stops. You really out. can't. So know how fast you're going to drive. I've gotten more confidence through the years and yeah, I could drive faster. I don't always like to. So I just keep it around 70. Now, some of you may think I'm crazy, but that's just comfortable for me. So know your limitations and just with cruise control, some people like it, some don't. It, it may be a hot topic out there. Don't really hear much talk about it, but it's one of those things that I just prefer not to use. Stressor number 10, bug carnage on the cap of your RV. We all like to have a nice looking RV, don't we? And you travel 300 miles down the road one day, you get to your campground, you look up, and it is just covered in dead bugs and yuck. Not a whole lot you can do about it, except when you, I think you have to stay ahead of yourself, ahead of it, um, by just taking care of it every night. Just get out your extension pole and a rag or whatever and wipe it down, a little water, wipe it down a little bit and get rid of as much as you can. Most campsites will not allow you to wash your camper or your truck on site so you might have to look for an RV wash station um, a lot of times you can find them by um, or at a truck stop we like uh, blue beacon so we've been stopping there although we did find another place on the way home from this trip that we stopped at we made sure that we wrote it down so we always remember where it is when we come back from a trip out west so just another stressor of not having a camper. We have a brand new camper. We hate when it looks like that. Okay, let's talk about that bonus stressor and flat tires. And what am I holding in my hand? It's the sensor that fits on your tire to help you know what your tire pressure and temperature of the tire is. Why is that important? Well. That's going to fluctuate during your trip, and sometimes maybe you've run over a uh, who knows a nail, whatever it might be, and you've got a slow leak. And that's one of the things that happened to us several years ago when we were in Pigeon Forge. We were on I-40, and all of a sudden our TPMS system just started going off. And the first thing you really have to think about is. Do I have time to move to a safe location? Sometimes you might not, and the only option you've got is getting off on the side of the road and dealing with the traffic. Fortunately for us, we were able to drive about five or six miles, get off at the exit, pull into a gas station, and safely inflate the tire to get us to our campsite, which was about four miles away. You never know when you're gonna have a flat tire, and you need to be prepared for when that's going to happen. What does preparation include? Well, you gotta have the right equipment. For me, the one thing I've done, I've gone a little bit further and I've marked all my wrenches so that I know exactly what size they are and which ones to use. Another thing is having road flares so that you can alert that oncoming traffic that you're pulled off to the side of the road and they can move over for you. Vests, safety vests safety glasses. Make sure you have all of that so that you're going to be able to safely get that tire off and the new one, the spare, on. So it's not an Indy 500 pit stop because you need to make sure that you're being not only efficient but safe and putting everything back the right way so that you don't have another problem further down the road. We appreciate you joining us and we hope you've been able to learn a little bit uh, from these different stressing points that, that we've shared with you, what, you know, whether you're new to RVing, whether you're experienced, but we know that travel day is never going to be easy. Some days are stress-free while others really aren't. And sometimes you also, no matter 
how much preparation you do, there could be that construction that's lurking somewhere out there on the roads, or maybe there's an accident that somebody's had that you're gonna get caught up in. But whatever you can do on the front end to alleviate some of the problems that come with RVing and travel, you're gonna be further ahead by taking all of that into account. So what do you think? Have we helped you at all? Um, we wanna hear if you have any tips to offer or if you have a great story that you wanna share with us <laughs> that maybe we can learn from. So stay safe out there and we'll look forward to seeing you on, on the, the trails. trails. Bye for now.